What I'm going to do is to first of all introduce the panellists that, that, that we have. Um, sitting to my uh, far right is uh, writer, broadcaster, Times columnist David Aronovich. Um, sitting next to him is William Bennett. William is a, a barrister at a set of chambers called 5RB. For those of you who are not familiar with them, they are sort of the media set really, or certainly one of them, like to think of themselves as the media set, very big in privacy, very big in, uh, in libel, um, and uh, they have certainly been beneficiaries of uh, the growth of our privacy law. I think you probably agree with that, William? Uh, sadly, that's true. Um, <laughs> Okay, and now sitting to my far left is uh, David Allen Green. Uh, David is both a lawyer and a writer. Uh, he is head of media at, how do you pronounce that? Preschool and Co. Uh, and he was selected as one of the hot 100 lawyers for 2011 in the Lawyer magazine, and I'm sure you all agree he's looking pretty hot tonight. Um, <laughs> he's also legal correspondent of the New Statesman, and he was shortlisted for the Orwell Prize in 2010 for his Jack of Kent blog. And just joining us, um, but we haven't really started yet, Peter, so um, you're in good time, is Peter O'Born, who is, as you know, the Daily Telegraph's chief political commentator. There is just a huge amount to discuss. Um, I've been covering privacy and super injunctions for the BBC for the last uh, couple of years and frankly it is the news story that just never stops giving. Uh, another day, another injunction, another melting of an injunction through Twitter or through some uh, intervention by an MP. Um, what I'm going to do at the beginning is just to throw out a few ideas, uh, provocative ideas I hope, that uh, we can then pick up in discussion. Um, but basically, first of all, how do we get to this point um, that we're currently at? How do we get to this point where there are many people perhaps in this country who believe that democracy is genuinely under threat because they don't know who 30 people are sleeping with? Um, you know, why have, how have we arrived, being obviously rather ironic and tongue-in-cheek, tongue -in but certainly um, there's been a very, very effective campaign by the print media uh, to melt the injunction system. There's only one way of protecting privacy, that is by uh, the form of an injunction. If you ask Max Mosley whether damages protect privacy, um, you'll get a very short and dusty answer from him. If you, if you uh, Google Max Mosley for time immemorial, you will get the words Nazi-style orgy. Um, privacy, it's often said, is like an ice cube. Once it's melted, it's gone. You can't reform it. Uh, so there has been, you know, a... a, a a very uh, active campaign. Um, you know, the print media clearly are not that keen on injunctions, um, and that's perhaps one of the reasons why all of these injunctions are often inc included under the banner of super injunctions. We know super injunctions actually, uh, there have only been two super injunctions in fact granted since January 2010, since the John Terry uh, one was lifted. Um, but nonetheless, the term persists and it casts this terrible awful shadow that there is this secret justice going on that's hugely dangerous and that we should all be very worried about. Um, so uh, one of the things I'd like to pick up in discussion is uh, you know, how have we got to this point? Have we been somewhat hoodwinked uh, into fearing these injunctions when perhaps um, we shouldn't? Or are they genuinely being used by rich and powerful people to gag the press, to prevent freedom of expression um, in a way that is very unfair and indeed that is locking down on stories that aren't just trivial stories about who people happen to be having sex with um, but are serious, more serious stories where you know, the light of, of the press ought to shine. So let's um, talk about all of that. Um, for me, one of the interesting things that this brings up is, or, or raises is actually, who runs Britain? Um, another idea I'd just like to throw out there. Who, who does run Britain? Is it, is it uh, Parliament? Is it the government? Is it um, the judiciary? Is it the tabloid press? Is it Europe? Because at the root of all of this is the Human Rights Act. Um, that was written into our law in 2000. Ever since that, that happened, certainly as we go through the Naomi Campbell case in 2004, um, you know, the, our, the, our, our privacy law has developed and this battle royal between rich and powerful people, influential people who want to protect their privacy on the one hand and the press who want to write about it on the other. So let's pick up um, all of that. Um, so far as phone hacking is concerned, 
Um, obviously, another hugely important uh, news story at the moment. How big is it? How long was it going on for? Uh, how? Oh, but one of the questions that I might, in fact, one of the questions, David, I'm going to put it to you first of all, actually, um, is this. Um, is there an element of hypocrisy in the fact that the news media, the print media, have been, on the one hand, as I say, telling people that, you know, super injunctions, injunctions are incredibly serious and are affecting, you know, freedom of expression and what the right that they have to know about things, on the one hand, and on the other, and the organisation that, that you work for, is defending phone hacking on a pretty large scale on the other. Um, how, do you, how do you square... I'm sure you didn't mean to say it was defending phone hacking. <laughs> um, uh, as far as I know, nobody from uh, News Corporation has ever stood up and said, you know, that phone no. hacking, that's a jolly good Let idea. me immediately qualify for those <laughs> We all do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, let, me, let me immediately... Thank you for picking me up on that. Let me, let me immediately qualify that. They are defending some civil claims for breach of privacy that arise out of phone hacking, and we know that there are quite a large number of them. Um, now, is, is, is there a hypocrisy there? Well, at one level, there's, there's a distressing lack of hypocrisy there, um, uh, in one sense, which is that fundamentally a large section of, um, of our more popular press believes that any story that is of interest to the public, um, in other words, that would sell a newspaper, um, and therefore sell everything else that might be in the newspaper, is justified more or less however it is obtained if you can do it without being caught. Um, I think that's. I think that essentially summarises it. Uh, then certain things are made illegal, and that becomes problematic. They notice it in time, or they don't. I mean, one of the things about phone hacking is it's almost certainly. Well, it certainly it wasn't just uh, news corporation paper, newspapers that were involved, and that's one of the reasons why some other newspapers have been remarkably quiet uh, about it during the course of uh, during the course of. It. And actually, uh, if you think about it, was it morally right to do phone hacking before phone? hacking was explicitly made illegal. Um, who were the people who were paying Benji the bin man to go through people's bins in order to get material? Um, why was it that the um, society of uh, that the editors and the uh, sort of get exemption to the rule of um, uh, to, to rules in the Data Protection Act, which would have prevented uh, journalists effectively or criminalised journalists effectively getting uh, information about people's gas bills and so on, um, etc. Elements of that um, uh, uh, potentially illegally. Um, in other words, in other words, you can make an argument that anything you get do to get a story that you believe to be either in the public's interest or the public's interest in is in some sort of odd way justified. Yeah. So Peter Ogorn in on that from the Telegraph. No, I do think there's the most incredible hypocrisy. I completely agree with your observation. If you follow the um, press over the last few months, there's been a uh, fantastic amount of stuff in the press about the super injunctions. Uh, and I think that one of the most shameful days in the history of Parliament was when parliamentary privilege was used, uh, parliamentary privilege was used to reveal to the world that a footballer was having an affair. I, I, I felt really ghastly. And that, of course, was cheered on by that decision, that, that, that act of infamy, really, that act of defiance of the rule of law, um, was, uh, was, was cheered on by a lot of the media. Um, and at the same time, we've read virtually nothing, with one or two exceptions, which are very honorable exceptions, the Guardian newspaper in particular, but also the Independent, uh, and other papers have covered it less, um, some not at all. Uh, in the phone hacking thing, which in the phone hacking we had a News International, broadly speaking, behaved like a criminal organisation, was a criminal organisation, I don't know, I imagine it stopped now, I hope it stopped now, but the news of the world for sure was a um, criminal organisation, it used criminal techniques, it hacked uh, the phones of the Prime Minister it seems, that we're now hearing, of the Deputy Prime Minister, of, of anybody going uh, it utter, it, Kate Middleton, the future queen, we're now learning. Um, now, um, there was a sort of, um, and we read virtually nothing about this, with the exception of the estimable investigative journalism 
of Nick Davies in The Guardian. And I think that is, it is a shameful double standard. And um, I think that we have to uh, confront that I in the media. There is, which is more s serious, I don't know. I think that I'm much more uh, sympathetic with super injunctions and some of my colleagues in the press because I basically believe in the rule of law. I think that's one of the very few things. When you ask what, what, who governs Britain, ultimately the most important thing of all is the rule of law and the attacks on the rule of law uh, by, the, uh, by the newspapers, both in regard to super injunctions and in, in regard to phone hacking makes me very uncomfortable about being a journalist. David, I agree. Just on that point about the rule of law, um, <coughs> you know, there's no question that uh, if court injunctions are being breached left, right and centre, there almost now seems to be a recipe, doesn't there, for, for melting uh, a privacy injunction. You know, newspaper puts something on the front pages, it gets into the Twitter sphere, people tweet about mm -hmm. it, uh, then perhaps an MP stands up in Parliament uh, and names the person. Um, you know, there are really worrying aspects to that, aren't there? Well, I think the starting point is to realise there's a, there is a fairly casual attitude in the mainstream media towards privacy issues and also legality. Even te Telegraph, for example, uh, the MP's expenses, somehow, some way, that was released to the Telegraph and one can take a pretty good guess that the way it was released was not in accordance with data protection law. Uh, the clandestine recording of Vince Cable, probably justified, probably not. The only thing with any public interest was then sat on by the Telegraph and then uh, splashed by the BBC. So there is, even in good quality newspapers, there can be that element of a casual attitude towards legality, a casual attitude towards privacy. Why? Well, for a very long time, uh, journalism, as David has more or less implied was more or less what you could get away with. Most of the phone hacking scandal took place when the regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, Data Protection Act and the Computer Misuse Act were all fully in force. But it was at a nice, convenient distance. It didn't, did not bite. And even further away in the distance was the PCC code, which was just laughed at. Mm. The one thing which, one of the many reasons why there has been this storm about the so-called super injunctions and privacy injunctions generally, is because, curiously, they work. A, a court-given order, a newspaper that should not do something, cannot casually be broken. And most newspapers will not actually break a direct court order which is addressed to them. <coughs> so part of the reason why it has come to a head now is that the courts have reached a point where privacy is being protected by things which have a bite and the newspapers don't like it. Mm. Well, do they have a bite? Let me bring in uh, w William Bennett at that point because you know, if these things can, I mean, it's going to be, I don't know, you know, what clients have been coming through the doors recently, but I would suggest it's a very brave, rich and powerful person now who even thinks about going to get a court injunction. If you look at, um, for instance, you know, what happened in the, uh, yeah, with, with, with Ryan Giggs, then, you know, people say, well, you know, had that story just come out in the normal way, it would have been a you know, one week, two week wonder. Instead of which, you know, Ryan Giggs is now you know on free speech's it's most wanted list. And it's, it's you know, so how many how many people are are actually going to go for these things in future? And are you going to advise them to even go for them? Well, putting putting the law to one side, you're you're right. The Ryan Giggs affair, if it had been published at the outset, would have been today's fish and chip paper. But what the Sun has done since then and news of the world is says, look, look celebrities, look footballers, if you dare cross us in court, this is what we're going to do. And we've had day after day of, of coverage. And even today on the front page of the Sun, you'll see that uh, Ryan Giggs' brother is now accused of having an affair while Ryan Giggs was having an affair with his wife. <laughs> so you can see, as often, often happens in these privacy cases, the facts just don't concern the celebrity. They also concern the people who someone unkindly called and snobbishly called civilians. 
But as to whether they work or not, one thing that people are not, is not being brought to their attention is on the one hand you had the screaming in the newspapers about how unfair this is and how supposedly this is stopping your right to know about who's sleeping with whom and who's shoving what up what orifice. The newspapers generally, when these applications are made, which are made on a Friday afternoon, they're very straightforward applications. Generally there isn't much evidence in conflict. And what the newspaper has to do is go along and say there is a public interest in this story and they most almost always fail in that argument and then what they do is they don't appeal it or they don't take the matter to trial they let it just rest because they know as far as the law is concerned they're on a hiding to nothing but you have to also bear in mind that sometimes when they do take on the claimant they win and recently you have seen that with Gordon Ramsay's father-in-law who originally got an, got an injunction no, sorry, originally an injunction was turned down by Mr Justice Eady. He would not give him an injunction in privacy. You have read nothing about that in the media. You will only see that judge pilloried in the most unfair fashion. But then, good on, I think it was the News of the World and the Daily Mirror and Associated, took it to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal upheld Mr Justice Eady and said there was a public interest because there were elements about the way Ramsey's um, empire was being run and certain pronouncements been made in the media. So from the legal point of view, it, it, it's not all bad. I just want to follow up on that. I, I, is it your view that it, if there is ever a public interest, the injunction will just never be granted? Uh, because, uh, because that's not the view that you get from, from the press. Um, uh, 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 absolutely it is. And some t talk earlier on about The Guardian. I read Alan Brus Brusbridge's speech or lecture a couple of weeks ago on libel and privacy law. Guardian has been a great supporter of privacy law and he made the point that privacy law has not stopped the Guardian from publishing any story it wanted to publish. Because it's publishes, I'm not praising the Guardian, I'm sure this applies to all broadsheets, it's more interested in publishing stories of genuine public interest and not perhaps particularly interested in publishing stories about celebrities' sex lives. Okay, da David, how do but you... But we do need yeah. to challenge this, by the way. I mean, although I am sympathetic to your point about Ryan Giggs or whatever, I, I don't want to know, and I don't think there is a right for us to know. Trafigura, which is a big company which has got an injunction. Which has nothing to do with privacy. We got a or super injunction. We weren't allowed to mention super injunction, uh, Trafigura, which was a big corporation which was. But Trafigura was not a privacy case. Just explain why it well, wasn't, yeah, David. Enough, explain yeah. why it wasn't. Trafic Trafigura is. There are certain uh, principles where the courts will say a genie can go out the bottle. So, for example, there's confidentiality. If there's confidential information, once it's public, it's not confidential anymore. <coughs> a similar uh, principle is a, something called legal professional privilege. You know, your ability to communicate frankly with your lawyers before court. Trafigura had commissioned this report, a draft report for litigation. It was completely covered by legal professional privilege. The reason they got a super injunction was not because they claimed it was private, that is a complete myth, it was because it was covered by legal professional privilege. The same legal professional privilege, you will note, the Guardian has never relaxed either in respect of its legal advice in any of its litigation, nor has the Telegraph, because that is not what you do with documents which are created under legal professional privilege. The super injunction was granted not to protect the privacy of Trafigura, or the reputation, or the confidence. Yeah, we got that, but you, it was nevertheless, it was a super injunction which, which made, made it secret from the public and stopped newspapers publishing disgraceful behaviour by a large corporation. But the Telegraph, uh, I mean, the, the, the I mean, Telegraph would not public would not that's why you're just, privilege either. I, th we're discussing super injunctions as well as privacy here today, that's as you could see in the, uh, and so it, it, this sort of cl clever stuff from the legal profession, we can uh, move on from that. Well, hang on. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> hang on, hang any, on. Contrary, on con any contradictory evidence? Will no, be, no, uh, no. It's a, it, the super injunction was used to stop the publication of disgraceful information concerning traffic Europe. Well, but, but and, uh, and that's what we were discussing, the censorship of the press. Well, it, wasn't it actually used um, to prevent the reporting? Not the, the uh, actually, it was not the asking of the question in Parliament, but to prevent the reporting of the question in, in Parliament. Um, and, and as you say, the, 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 the basis of it was the legal professional privilege. The Guardian played a very clever game in getting that in, uh, story into the press. 
it corresponded with the law firm acting for Trafigura. And in a move which probably wasn't <coughs> that law firm's greatest moment, it sent a letter saying, we think the injunction would cover questions in Parliament. That actually is not what the injunction said. The injunction was just a, a non-publication injunction. But once Trafigura's lawyer said that, the Guardian then did a story which said, we are being prevented from uh, publishing that a parliamentary question has been asked. That was just based on a piece of correspondence from the other side's lawyers, not the terms of the injunction itself. They then we need to get into this sort of... Um, but, but that got... OK, all right. Well, then that, that got into the Twitter sphere. It seems to, it seems to offend against the, every British notion of what we ought to know about what's going on. And The Guardian on wrote an incredibly clever story which allowed anybody with any sense to mm. decode it within moments to find mm. the parliamentary question. Mm. OK. Let me, let me just... I want to ask David and Peter this, actually. But wh how do you square um, what William says, that whenever there's a public interest, there's no way an injunction will ever be granted? On the one hand, with the impression that I think many people have, that somehow stories that are absolutely in the public interest that they should be able to know about, they can't know about because of injunctions or super injunctions. Firstly... I wonder whether, I mean, I might, and I actually agree with Peter about in almost everything he said, so in a way I'm going to try to explain the attitudes of absent friends uh, uh, here a little bit because I would imagine that it would uh, need to be done. Uh, if you go back to Paul Dacre's speech to the Society of Editors in 2008, most of it is there if you decode it. And what he essentially says is, as I said, we require not just to tell people what it is that they need to know in order to run a democracy, but we need to tell them what it is that is sensational and wonderful. Okay. Now, he then bats it around with all kinds of hypocrisies about we need to shame people, we need to take a stand against adulterers, etc., etc., it's necessary for society. But in essence, this is what he says, and he also, you refer to the Nair B. Campbell uh, case, he also referred to one of the judgments by the judge in that case, one of the statements by the judge in that, and by uh, Lord Wolfe, which was that both of them recognised that in order to sell newspapers so that you could tell people the things that they needed to hear, you needed to be able to echo Economic, for economic reasons, you needed to be able to tell stories that they just simply wanted to hear. So it's about keeping the industry alive it's commercially about, so it's that about, you get the, the public interest stories it's along about, with the rest. It's about, keeping, it's about keeping it alive. And this goes to the heart of the other major hypocrisy in this, which we all know about, which is that people will say one thing about whether or not they think privacy ought to be invaded and do another when they're looking at the consequences of an invasion of another's privacy. And not just mail readers, sun readers, but Guardian readers, Times readers, Telegraph readers, and just about everybody in this room too. Okay. Peter Edwards, does that do it for you, the fact that you know, the, the justification is, you, you know, we, in France the newspaper industry is propped up by about a billion, uh, if I'm figures are right, about a billion euros worth of subsidy and students have to be paid to buy newspapers and, and that sort of thing. And we don't want that sort of industry, we want a thriving commercial industry. So, you know, if we're getting the sort of uh, tittle-tattle yeah. stories, uh, in, am um, but in amongst it we're getting the stories we really need to know about, then that's fine. No, I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm a supporter of the Human Rights Act and I, it introduced the notion of privacy and to British law. And it also introduced the notion of freedom of expression. I mean, we had that, <coughs> sorry, I, we, we had that. And I think what, what we're talking about here is that ever since uh, 1999 or whatever it was, it, it's quite vaguely phrased. I mean, the lawyers are, I mean basically the, 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 the lawyers are sorting out, the judges are sorting out exactly where that balance lies. Uh, and because it's taking a bit of it's taking a bit of time, some of them cases I don't really understand them. I find it very reveal, very very helpful to listen to you about traffic Europe. I, I don't, but I I can I do not think I don't feel happy where I can destroy somebody's personal private life and ruin the children ruin the lives of their children. Uh, I don't think that is a, a, a professional. That's one of the things to. that Max Mosley says. You know, who should have the right to decide whether they're going to effectively melt and destroy your privacy? Should it be a tabloid editor or should it be a High Court judge? William, well, can, can I just as a touch on what uh, David was talking about? Which really the, the cross subsidisation within a tabloid. So, for instance, today's Sun runs on the front page runs on yet another Ryan Giggs story. 
uh, splashed over pages four and five, but also pages six and seven, there is a Tony Blair I interview, which does touch on unserious subjects. And if you read any tabloid, there is good good stuff in there, and it's good on any analysis. I wouldn't say any. Well, <laughs> of course, the Sunday Sport has now relaunched, proving the, the vibrancy of British uh, British press. But I think it's more than that. I think the the huge uh, furore at the moment is almost like a cultural shift because there mm. is something within the culture of this country that we love, and your description of everyone in this room and everyone else, we love as human beings, particularly people with our sort of cultural background in the UK, this sort of rumbustiousness in the media. You know, look at her, look what she's doing, look who she's sleeping with. Um, but are we entering into a sort of, a, if you like, a sort of next step up in civilization where we're starting to say, well, no, we don't. We don't want to do that anymore. But it's unfortunate when it comes from the top down rather than well, the, the bottom. To use an analogy with what you're saying, I mean, that one of the transformative moments in modern British newspapers was when the sun splashed a story about Elton John being gay. And they expected to sell millions of copies. It was going to be brilliant. In fact, they had to make a front page apology. Uh, they got their whole thing wrong. And they completely, uh, in uh, overnight, changed newspaper reporting of homosexuality. It was the mid-80s. Mid it could well be what you're saying. I, I don't, you see, the, well, I personally, I, it's me, but I blame Rupert Murdoch. I think he had a terrible effect on British public culture. He debased it, debauched it, uh, well, since he arrived here in the 1970s. If you go back, you say we have a culture of rumbustiousness, it makes it so, destroying people's lives yeah. in order to sell newspapers. We didn't have that culture. If you go back and read you know, the Daily Express, the biggest selling paper of the 1960s, Beaverbrook's Express, if you, you go back to that newspaper culture, it's a much more serious-minded newspaper culture. And uh, I, I would like to think, actually, that we are, are, are going through a transformative moment uh, and we are learning to, to, about to what, as you said, to be compassionate. Let me just pick up on, on that. I know you want to come in, David, but you say that, but it wasn't that long ago, I mean the late 80s, early 90s, there were two cases, weren't there? There was the case of Russell Harty um, and Gordon Kay. And Gordon Kay, the actor who was uh, extremely ill in hospital, and I think the a team from the Sunday Sport sort of burst into his room, purported to carry out an interview and take photographs of him when he was uh, really in a terrible way. And uh, Russell Harty, I think, was photographed with long lens photography when he was also extremely ill. And there was a huge public disquiet at that point, as much public disquiet as, you know, perhaps there is now in relation to, you know, to, to, to super injunctions, if you like. Um, and in fact, Gordon take, took his case to the Court of Appeal and they said to him, I'm sorry, there is no right of privacy. You haven't got a cause of action here. So are we, you know, is, is this just a cyclical thing? Are we going to go, are we, are we getting to a point now where, you know, there's so much uh, privacy that, you know, that, 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 that is, um, that we're learning about that perhaps we're going to row back from it think, you know, that's too much? Or where are we, David? Well, the Gordon K decision is probably where modern privacy law begins. Uh, what happened? Journalists burst into his room, effect, uh, affected to have an interview with him, took photographs and then splashed it as an exclusive. Went to court, argued privacy, failed on privacy. There was no privacy in English law, which was actionable. But what made it easy for the judges to say that in the Gordon K case, which is often overlooked, is that there was another so-called tort in English law called malicious falsehood. And because the newspaper had splashed it as an exclusive, the, 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 the courts felt relaxed about saying, oh, there's no privacy law, because we can give you a remedy in malicious falsehood. But after that, after that little convenient fix, as it seemed at the time, people fixated on the fact that there seemed to be no privacy rights in English law. Then came the Human Rights Act. I defy any lawyer to get the Human Rights Act and point to a provision in that act which says there shall be a law of privacy. Mm. There is not a single <coughs> section in that act which says that. And everybody, every lawyer that says, oh, privacy brought, was brought in by the Human Rights Act, it wasn't. But what the Human Rights Act did do, a bit like the collection of paraphernalia at the start of an A-team episode, which allows them to create something by the end of it. It allowed the judges, by about 2004-2005, to fashion 
a law of privacy based on the law of confidence. And it was completely envisioned, wasn't it, at the time, that the role of developing the law would be given to the judges, and that's and that was the right thing, and that was the right way in which it should develop. But that's, they've, they've, they've had a hard time. It's fascinating to it. read the judgments after, 19, uh, after, after 2000. Because there's this one Court of Appeal decision where Stephen Sedley, who's just recently retired, says, Hurrah! We have now got a privacy law! And then the House of Lords said, No, we actually haven't. Uh, and so the European Court of Human Rights then decided a case about a. Hanover, which said you have a right to privacy. And so the courts went, okay, we haven't got a right to privacy, how do we deal with this? And so they took the law of confidentiality and somehow, some way, by squinting their eyes, mm. have turned that into a law of privacy. But this, stepping one side back, if we are taking privacy seriously as a human right, you've got to adopt a certain kind of public-private blindness. It shouldn't matter to anybody, whether it's a public authority, or a newspaper, or your next door neighbour who's invading your privacy. It's enough that your privacy is being invaded. And so this old language of people versus the press, or government versus the press, it's very 20th century. What you have is an individual with rights, and those rights are being infringed, and the courts are doing something to protect it, whether it be by the press or whether it be by the government. And that is what is now happening with human rights jurisprudence. David, just to come back to um, your point, but you've mentioned Paul Dacre and that famous speech that he made to the Society of Editors, yeah. and he talks about a privacy law being brought in through the back door. By, by but, Justice Eady, who, who was his proclaimed villain. Yes. Was Justice Eady alone yes, who was, who was who, creating who was this situation. For that. Yeah. But, uh, um, you know, uh, the big question, should Parliament now step in? Should there be, should Parliament debate this issue? Um, or, uh, you know, is it really the, r the, the right thing for our judges to be doing it on a case-by-case case basis? But there doesn't seem to be any parliamentary appetite to do it. Don't we feel, in a lot of this discussion, if we're honest, that if we crane our ears to the sound to the wind, we can hear the stable doors banging and the horses galloping away. I mean, isn't that what, isn't that what we really feel? I, I, I don't think Peter does uh, uh, Twitter, but the... <laughs> but, 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 <laughs> Do you think I don't think he does. He does. I don't think he, he tweets. Um, um, he's, you should, Peter. You'd enjoy it. <laughs> but the the I am Spartacus movement, effectively, mm. on Twitter is a very interesting thing. You, we, uh, Peter mentioned John Hemming. So here's the question. Why did John Hemming think that doing what had previously been regarded as such a disgraceful thing would actually be something that would make him more popular? Why did he think that? Was it just about that newspapers would treat him well, or was it something about the way in which people increasingly regard the issue of what it is they're allowed to know and not, uh, are not allowed to know in the era of, uh, of Web 2.0? I mean, and in other words, what I'm saying is the fairly obvious thing, which is that fundamental attitudes to what it is that people are permitted, expect to know, have altered. And at the same time, as we've had these adjudications about confidentiality in the court, something else has been happening out there in a substantial and influential part of the real world. And the expectation and definition of what we would, ex what we would think of as being privacy has changed. In other words, if we believe fundamentally in ourselves, not as a kind of not as a kind of intellectual construct, but in the way we talk about life in an everyday way and what we talk about to our friends, that Tiger Woods has no right to privacy because he is a famous golfer, then fundamentally we've changed our attitude towards what privacy is. And that is indeed what we believe. We, uh, and we anticipate and expect that we have the ability and therefore, in, in brackets, the right to but discuss these things. Let's come back to Tiger Woods in a minute, because it, it's an interesting case, if you like, right on the cusp, isn't it, between, you know, some people say it would be absolutely in the public interest because he's a brand and he's taking money from the public based on an image that's being projected, and if that's a false image, then it's absolutely in the public oh, yeah. interest. But we know that yeah. shit, don't we? But we know we know that people who really like Tiger Woods I see tabloid either liked him for the golf. Models. Can we expose their private not? lives? Most of the people who really liked him for the golf, which is what he was famous for, did not buy him on the basis that he had a very satisfactory sex life with his wife. <laughs> okay. Okay. Clearly uh, Manchester United broke. supporters do not care that Ryan Giggs had an affair or that Brian, Ryan Giggs' brother had an affair. That is not the same thing as saying that they're not very interested okay. in hearing all about it. And Fred Goodwin? 
Fred, well, Fred, well, we don't know, do we? I mean, actually, I mean, it's quite possible to have an affair with somebody in the office, and it isn't really the reason why all your purchases uh, and your big money investments went wrong. In fact, <laughs> on the whole, I would say that of all the explanations for Fred Goodwin's behaviour, I think him bonking a colleague is not the most likely. But well, there was there was an issue of corporate governance, I believe, with Fred Goodwin. I, I think sure. yeah. maybe. Well, let me just come to William um, for a second, and I'm going to throw this open to the audience in, in a moment. So, do you have have questions ready? Um, William, A, should Parliament legislate, B, could they legislate, and just draw a picture, because we know under the European Convention and we know under the Human Rights Act, you know, Article 8 doesn't take precedence over Article 10, um, they have to be balanced. Could Parliament actually come up with a privacy law that was satisfactory and that solved the problems we're now, well the press certainly are telling us that we have? And while you, you're answering, imagine the discussion in Parliament would have to happen to get there? Well, starting with, with that point, um, take my word for it, it's much better to develop a common law on a case-by-case -case basis based on broad principles of Article 8 right to privacy, Article 10 right to freedom of speech. I know as voters you probably find that horrific because you think that we've got so these, well with these, these great people in the House of Commons who have come up with some good law, but generally statute law isn't very effective. And statute law can't really get over this, some would say it's an advantage, some would say it's a problem, that no one has precedence in their rights over someone else. Each of us has the same rights as the editor of The Sun or as Paul Dacre. So Parliament, I suspect, might go through a cosmetic exercise, which I think is what they're doing in defamation, that, that, that's another story, uh, to say to people, look, we're busy, we're doing something, we've set up a committee, we're passing a bill, which in fact doesn't do very much. I can imagine they might do the same in, in privacy. But I think that, that there may be a, one way in which the problem could be got round, if it is in fact a problem, and that is not to change the law as such, but make it a bit more difficult to get these types of injunctions. But, and but, I think but part, Parliament's already done that. It's under Section well, 12 of the Human Rights Act. The, the test for an injunction in a privacy case is, yeah. is higher than it is in a normal case. Well, it, it's done it and failed because it can't overrule the fact that we have the same rights as Paul Dacre or anyone else. Parliament couldn't step in and change that. But what I think it could do, um, what I'm concerned about, is that we need to perhaps get back to a point of view where individuals have to deal with the slings and arrows of, of outrageous fortune, and sometimes you've just got to grin and bear it. The problem with human rights law is that it tries to deal with every situation, fairness of every situation, rather than creating some sort of threshold. And I think the law might do well to bring in some sort of threshold um, very quickly, for instance, when the law was developing, you remember Jamie Theakston was caught in a brothel, and the judge in that case said, OK, newspaper, you can publish the fact he was in the brothel. There's nothing, I'm not quite sure it's public interest, but I don't think he had a reasonable expectation in regard to that. But you can't publish the photographs that were taken. So I think there could be a sort of threshold of, <laughs> of seriousness. Yes, just imagine. The law, yeah. the law, and for the... For the sake of the in integrity and respect that the judiciary ought to be held in, um, get them out of this arena. But before you get too terribly sentimental about the common law passing from generation to generation, the tunes of Algar in the background, by about 2008, libel law was in a complete mess. Things in the public interest, like Simon Singh's comments about the chiropractic profession, Ben Goldacre's comments about vitamin salesmen, things which were genuinely were not capable of being published safely because of this case-by-case -case look by the common law. That's it is right. right and appropriate for Parliament to legislate. With privacy, however, Parliament has legislated. We do have privacy law. It's called the Data Protection Act. It's called the Regulation Investigatory Powers Act. It's the Prevention and Harassment Act. It's the Human Rights Act. There is a framework there. The question really is about enforcement and people abiding by the law. It's already there. Good. All right. Listen, um, I'd like to throw it open to the floor uh, now. So uh, there's bags more stuff we can talk about, but um just um, effectively, this it is a very subjective area of law. Obviously, just open to the interpretation of whichever judge a case comes in a case comes before. And in reality, it seems to have been down to to one or two judges for the most part, and possibly three or four in in the great scheme of things. Um, 
in spite of Article 12, um, are those judges still bound by all their previous decisions? Um, and if so, given a consideration of Article 8, which you referred to isn't actually a law of privacy, if I, I, my memory probably won't serve me correctly, but it's something about the right to respect for private and family life. Um, isn't it slightly hypocritical of everybody seeking anonymised orders or super injunctions to be using that type of law or that expression of their right to cover up matters which don't command any respect whatsoever and which actually avoid their responsibility and all consequences of their behaviour? Well, we answer that in two parts. First of all, I don't get privacy injunctions for a living. I, so William probably is in a better position to answer that directly. But the, for your initial point about subjectivity. For somebody's private information to be published, there is a sequence of subjective decisions. The person who holds that private information needs to tell her journalist. The journalist then needs to decide whether that's a story. The editor then has to decide whether it's worth winning the story or not. And some journalists and some newspaper lawyers argue that what should be conclusive is that the editor thinks it's in the public interest to win that story, which I probably don't think is the best person to make a decision impartially or objectively. Then you've got to get it past the newspaper's lawyers, and then only if it looks as if it's a winner will you probably notify the other side, who then subjectively have to decide whether they're going to oppose it, work out whether the so-called Streisand effect of it becoming more famous because of trying to oppose it is going to work, They've got to do it, and then, only then do they get to the judge, who you have characterised as being subjective, who then has to decide it according to set published criteria. I would contend that out of all those people, the person who's coming closest to the objective decision is the judge. Because they have settled law and they have the framework of the Human Rights Act. Whether that's a good thing or one thing is not, but I don't think it's right to dismiss the judge's decision as subjective, when there's a whole sequence of subjective decisions which have run up to that. Um, can I just come back on that, actually? Because one of the things that has been considered in the press in general and here tonight is just the matter of publication. Because I think we all know, particularly those that, that tweet or Twitter, um, that there have been a huge number of injunctions, including super injunctions, mm -hmm. and maybe some which haven't even got into the Twitter sphere which have been taken out, not against the press, but against civilians, as they've been referred to by somebody here tonight. And so this isn't actually just about publication. This is about the principle of one person's human rights overbearing sure. another's sure. on the single basis of a judge with his own particular moral peccadilloes deciding that he prefers somebody's private life of whatever abhorrent things they're going up to, overpowering somebody else's right to freely speak about how they might be pissed off that somebody, you know, has, has, has done something against so the, them. So, so they use, um, as far as I can see, this phrase about the as a person's reasonable expectation uh, and this is where the contract comes in let's take an example because uh, you, you'll often see it let's suppose you hire a nanny to look after your kids you're a famous person and that nanny decides that they would like to spill the beans on just a, what a dreadful parent that she or he uh, rarely a he um, uh, thinks that uh, you've been um, Usually, even if there isn't a contract, I think I'm right in saying there would be an implied contract, there would be a reasonable expectation of, uh, be a confidential relationship. of, of a confidential relationship. Mm -hmm. Now, that one may be relatively simple, but in the case, let's say, of a spouse who wishes to give details of a husband's behaviour or a wife's behaviour, for whatever reason, they've fallen out of love with them, they don't like them, they feel they've cheated, etc., what could we say about the reasonable expectation of confidentiality? Now there, of course, it begins to get much more difficult. That David, that's, where that's, where, that, isn't that, that's where the whole public interest test has been developed. I mean, the Naomi mm. Campbell case, uh, Baroness Hale graded speech, didn't she, from you know, from political speech right at the top, where you know that you're never going to stop publication of that, cultural, etc., right down to tittle tattle. But before we, and, we but had this discussion, uh, before we, when we were sitting downstairs, somebody was talking to, telling this tale about the plumber, and I think maybe now that is the moment to tell the tale of the plumber. 
are you allowed to, or is there, or was there only no, I allowed to hear? Because I'm a member, of the, I'm a journalist, and therefore won't say. No, no, anything. no. I've been reporting on that case. On, <laughs> been reporting on that case on the BBC today, actually. Oh right, okay. So we, can, we're, I can tell the story. Well, this is a case that's taking place at Westminster Magistrates Court, uh, and it's uh, a plumber called Ian Puddick, whose uh, wife had had a ten-year affair with uh, her former boss. Uh, and when he found out about it, he was very upset and angry about it, and he um, put information onto the uh, internet in, in the form of blogs, and uh, I think he took out a Twitter account um, and, and various websites. Um, and, the case, and he has been prosecuted under Section 2 of the Prevention of uh, Harassment Act. Um, and so that one of the issues in the case is whether that kind of speech can, can amount to, to harassment. Cri yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, the presumably crime, his defence is... The crime of harassment. A defence of free speech, is it not? But, well, I haven't know, because we, we just had the uh, prosecution case yeah. this morning, so I don't but, know. But David has just hit on a very amusing distinction between confidentiality and privacy. Because you would have the protection of the law of confidentiality with its full force, as long as the facts were true. If the facts weren't true, they weren't capable of having the, the quality of confidentiality. And so in a couple of cases, McKenna and Ash especially, <laughs> and the Beckham case, it was expanded to be any information about your private life, whether true or not. It was a fact. Uh, if it was a, a, and that was to protect Beckham from untrue allegations, you now tell me. Well, it was about any allegations about people's private life, whether it was true or not. The, and that, at a stroke, privacy law expanded beyond confidentiality law to protect any statements about your private life. It wasn't important whether it was true or not, it was just that it was about your privacy and it was invading your private spice, space. And to come back to your question, the normative issue right at the heart of this is, is everybody entitled to a private space? as a matter of basic principle. And I would suggest that they are, whoever that person is. Let, let me bring Peter in on that. I mean, it, you know, the idea of this of a reasonable expectation of privacy, that's the first part of the test that the judge will apply. And so obviously, you know, a phone call, private, an affair, private, there are lots of things that are quite clearly private. And if you do have that reasonable expectation of privacy, then the judge has to go on to consider freedom of expression and what's published in the, uh, whether it's in the public interest. Is it right that, you know, Baroness Hale graded speech and that, you know, certain types of speech are so important that there's always a public interest. But if it is just private stuff, tittle-tattle, I think it was called in that case, then really no one ought to know about it. Um, by the way, of course, uh, it's before I, I, I... I'm not really qualified. I, I haven't read the Hale judgment. It sounded very interesting. Uh, probably, it sounded like I agreed with it. But it's worth bearing in mind that um, the reason why that Beckham thing happened, of course, that he was... Um, I assume that the reason was that he was bugged by um, or hacked into uh, by uh, the news of the world. That's how that story came out. I would assume. I don't think we've actually Many discovered others that. probably. Uh, yeah. yeah. And um, but yeah, I thought that made a uh, made a lot of sense. Actually, I, I wasn't aware of it, and I think that's right. There is stuff which is automatically in the public domain. But can I just move? I want to challenge, I, want to, I don't want to be as pessimistic, by the way, on Twitter as David Aronovich. It seems to me that it is possible to, to, to regulate Twitter. I mean, it's published, it's a publisher. <laughs> Twitter is a publisher. It's got an enormous commercial interest in, uh, in operating, I would assume. It's not a publisher. It's like a publisher in the way British uh, well, anyway, a publisher. Yeah, and it's, um, I, I think you can make it's an, an important argu distinction. You can make an argument that it, is, it provides a it medium in which people exchange information uh, and um, it seems therefore in the same sense that a television channel is, is success. It, it Would you call the Royal Mail a publisher? But uh, that is, the information is, the pri one private letter is sent to another private individual. The Twitter thing is a public in exchange of information which can be viewed, as I understand it, as David Aronovich correctly observes, I don't do it, uh, is, uh, <laughs> I understand that others read these conversations. And, then, uh, and you, may, uh, you may examine other people's mail, and I would leave that between you and your conscience. I'm, but, a, um, I'm not a journalist in the way you are. <laughs> but, um, that's an insulting remark, and I do not uh, make a habit of illegally examining other people's mail. Indeed, there is a law against, I'm sure there is a law, about against intercepting and reading 
ex letters which are exchanged. I'm just destroying As long case. as they're not by Ed Balls. <laughs> yes. uh, and there are certain government intelligence agencies which are in, entitled to investigate these letters. And so you're, you've just wrecked your own argument with that rather inact <laughs> um, comparison with the post office. It just drag, drag, brings home my point. Twitter is a public exchange. And I do not see why, if you choose to soil somebody's reputation, make false allegations about people on Twitter, you shouldn't be um, you shouldn't be uh, open to being charged yeah. in court. And you can be. Yeah. Where you are, okay. right, so just to save you from yourself, is that the people <laughs> publishing on Twitter are publishers, but Twitter itself is not a publisher. Well, I, I there was a libel case, wasn't there, in which Google was not uh, found yes. not, not to be a publisher. Now, but it's an important distinction. If you use Twitter to publish things, yes, you are absolutely right. The person posting that comment is a publisher. And therefore, I do think that I believe that people can go onto Twitter anonymously. And exactly. I think that it's yes. up to that. That can be challenged. Well, I anonymously agree with you, so anonymously Twitter itself and abroad. is a publisher. Yeah. I know this gentleman at the back wants to ask a question, so let's, let's go over that. Uh, just very quickly, you said that the <coughs> that um, everything had to, to have uh, was judged to be in the public interest to be published. Went to the courts. If it's in the public interest, it was okay to publish. So, which of the recent big news stories, sexually, were in the public interest? Sorry, sex stories were in the public let, interest. Let me put that. One, I'll, I'll put that one to David. Just, just by the way, we were talking. William and I were talking earlier. And I was saying that, to my knowledge, there are only three privacy cases that have ever actually fought all the way. There's Naomi Campbell's, she went all the way to the House of Lords, she got £3,500. There was uh, Max, Max, Max Mosley, uh, and I think McKenna and Ash as well. But that's, a, that's, that's less than 3%, probably, of all privacy cases. So the reason they stop at the injunction stage, and many people say the reason they stop at the injunction stage is that there's never a public interest, and therefore there's never a, you know, the, the, it, there's, it's never worth fighting. But, David, perhaps you disagree well, I, I, with that, No, I don't, I don't disagree with it, but, but again, I'm forced to kind of put the alternative point of view. I mean, uh, Peter was working for, for Paul Dacre when he made the point in 2008, effectively, that it was in the public interest for sensational stuff to be printed because they bought the newspapers and therefore bought other stuff with it. I mean, it's an ingenious <laughs> argument, but it's an argument that judges themselves have made, actually, with regard to the freedom of the press. Don't do this. Don't allow print newspapers to print salacious stories about people's sex lives, and you lot won't buy the papers. And as a consequent, you won't hear the other stuff which we buy. I, mean, we, we, I think we can kind of reiterate. Re right right. Now this is this is. Uh, by the way, can I just clarify something? And Paul Dacre is a very great man, and uh, so forth. <laughs> I don't, the cameras over there. But I don't um, <laughs> always, and I was even, I remember vividly the Daily Mail leader conference on the day of the Naomi Campbell case, which was quite, um, quite, a, quite a lively news conference. But I don't share all of Mr. Dacre's views on it. Uh, nor, uh, nor would anybody think that you did. <laughs> yes, um, and, I certainly, I, I, and I certainly don't think you did. So, yeah. so, so the answer to your question is that then there is the other side of what Dacre put um, in, his, in, in his speech, which is quite widely believed. And actually, I found it fairly widely believed, not just by people I didn't expect to in my own paper, but actually far more generally amongst Times readers. And it was this. Uh, let's take the case of adultery. If a man or a woman in the public sphere is adulterous, that tells you that they're prepared to cheat on their spouse and that they are a liar. And you shouldn't extend the same rights to cheats and liars that you extend, even if it's in the private realm, that you extend to other people. Um, I don't believe that at all, because I don't believe you can look inside other people's hearts like that and describe their, uh, and understand their emotions. But that is a very, very widely held belief. I had imagined that my view that this was not the case was uh, generally held. I have discovered within the last few months and so on that actually I'm wrong. Um, and a significant number of people in Britain, including people you wouldn't expect to believe it, actually believe the opposite. There's an interesting, um, just, just to toss an interesting um, fact, I did a, a panorama programme on this a couple of years ago. Mark Oton was on the programme. Uh, and he made the point that, um, you remember Mark Oton, the Lib Dem MP who uh, had an affair with a rent boy, um, it, it was uh, you know, he, you know, a pretty lurid story in the tabloids, but he what he said was actually, on reflection, he thought they were right to publish it because he thought that it exposed errors in his judgment. 
which was an interesting, uh, an inter he said it was deeply private, deeply private, but he thought ultimately the press were right to publish it. a slightly different point from yours, David, but it, you know. Can you it, explain it's, it's why that's different actually? It's quite interesting. Why well, I, th I think what he's saying, you know, a free press is messy, but it's free. And why would, yeah. Dave, what did you say on, uh, what, what would you say about the market? Was the News of the World right to publish on Mark Oaten? Well, I say Mark about Mark Oaten is, firstly, um, I don't think the reason why people were reading that stuff and were interested in it had anything to do with whether it had anything to do with his judgment as an MP. I think that's a really important thing. The motivation of we the readers and the people who put it out is quite important in all this and I don't think, I think there's a huge gap between that and the professed concern that we have and that makes us hypocrites in quite a big way. Now the question then comes is whether we're useful hypocrites, whether that hypocrisy serves some useful social purpose and that's something which actually you can begin to discuss these days for the first First time. Um, uh, th 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 there are plenty of books about it. But do I believe Mark Oton when he says that I could understand him better as a candidate for the Liberal Democrat leadership because he got Rent Boys to do that particular thing to him? No, I don't really think I do. I mean, I'm not. I'm not an expert on coprophilia and what it means uh, and so on and what, it's kind of, what it con connotes. And it may be that a psychiatrist could tell me that I'm wrong and that if he had been leader, this would have been a sign of a, a, of a very significant personality problem, but I don't know it. An easy, straightforward point to make is which of our great, it's a point which a number of people will be familiar with, is which of our supposedly great former prime ministers would have been exposed in that same so sort of circumstance. Pitt the Younger, Palmerston, Gladstone, Lloyd George, Churchill, all had faults which were... He Hang on, I, I, I've recently... I seem to remember that Pitt the Younger is deemed by historians to have been um, <laughs> blameless in his... In other words, didn't have a sex life. I was too... Church well, that tells you something. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking more of his drinking habits, which you've yeah, overlooked. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, he, yeah, he drank a lot. But he—I uh, mean, you know—I I think you're, today. he wouldn't have. Um, Peter's not against the high, heavy drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. no, but I'm just saying, just it, even politicians are entitled to a, a, a private space. Even dare I say, prisoners convicted of very serious offences are entitled to a private space. Everybody in this room mm. is entitled to a private space. Let's see, let's go. I'm not sure you've got an answer to your question. I don't think anyone's picked out one of the recent crop of cases and said that. I think the answer was I'm no. I'm going to press that then. Just on Mark Oden, was Mark Oden wrong to say that or right, as you reported him saying? Yes, that's a good question. I, agree. I was a government. Mark Oden, do you think? For all his faults, he asked for. When I was a government lawyer, he asked a parliamentary question which completely foxed the government legal service for a very long time because it was when the Freedom of Information Act came out and he asked the same question as a parliamentary question and as a Freedom of Information request and the initial response was we're going to give him two different answers and then it was actually we can't do that because obviously he's obtained you know entitled to the same information either way and so I'm one of the very few people who whenever I hear of Mark Oton I don't think about this I think God, this bloke was actually a really good politician. So he, he was, was wrong. Actually so he was wrong. Uh, is the answer. I agree. I thought he was a splendid and shadow home affairs. But, 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 but as yeah. to your actual question, who makes the decision? Well, if we are taking privacy seriously as a right, I mean, we are actually taking it seriously, should it be the journalist or the editor or the in-house newspaper lawyer who says, yes, the public interest is greater? Or is it the judge? And I actually say that in almost all circumstances, the judge is in a better position to make that decision than the vested interests of the mainstream media, journalist, editor, okay. in-house lawyer, Nexus. OK, let's have another. Yeah. People say we need to know about hypocrisy of public figures, but they tend to only mean politicians it, it, or celebrities. Is, is, what you're, is what you're asking you that if there's a story about an adulterous judge, that that's, that should be fair game in the same way well, that... Well, uh, quite, absolutely. If these are the people making the decisions, then they should be open to the same um, observations as... Uh, you as agree with the creditors, though? But even the judge who argues that there should be privacy, would, should they be open to a lack of privacy themselves? No, presumably. So it would only be a judge who would argue that... So what you're looking for is hypocrisy, yes? Um, OK, well, that's fair enough. If what you're looking for is hypocrisy, then you'll find plenty of it. I mean, uh, there are plenty of people who take a vast and prurient interest in other people's adultery, partially because they are themselves either adulterers or, as Jimmy Carter famously said, has committed adultery in his heart. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Fancy telling Playboy that. Um, let's, I think we've got another question over there. Yeah. 
Uh, I, Martin Moore, Media Standards Trust. Um, on phone hacking, uh, again, um, uh, it seems ironic that despite uh, the, the civil cases, the many civil cases that are now being settled, um, the various common select committees. Yeah. Uh, and well, the, only one of them has been settled so far, only the Sienna Miller case. Only one has been settled so far. So far. There is a strategy. There is a strategy behind that. The sort of the there seems to be, which yeah. seems to be working. Oh, the Gordon Taylor one was paid off, and others have been paid well, off. And Max but, Clifford. There yes, have been settled but, places. But, uh, and William, Stone, we're, correct, and we're, we're, we're proceeding is actually issued in either of those cases. As, as, mm. as far as I know, Max Clifford. Clifford and uh, Gordon Taylor, I don't think proceedings were issued, but they were settled. Uh, the other public case is Sienna Miller a settlement, but if okay. you go back to the old Bailey, there are a number of victims named on the indictment. There's a suspicion that some of them got a decent uh, payoff, and of course Tom Watson says very interesting things in the House of Commons last week or the week before about senior members, senior Labour MPs, perhaps entering to settlements about what hacking which took place while they were in government. Well, I'm going to come back to your question in a moment. Whilst, whilst we're on this point, one, one thing that I just have to ask, because um, I'd, I'd like to know what your thoughts are. Um, why is it widely reported that Max Clifford got a million pounds, Gordon Taylor something in the region of £700,000? I don't think either of them ever confirmed or, or denied that, but it seems to be widely accepted that those sort of figures. <laughs> and Sienna Miller who was hacked over a period of a, uh, a year or so, there were 11 articles written as a result of that, gets £100,000. What? Why? A, a very, very simple difference. The big payouts at the beginning were for hush money. Uh, that, those amounts of money were paid when the public just, and people generally, just weren't aware this had happened. And the, presumably the news of the world paid, if it's true, way over the odds because as part of the settlements they got confidentiality agreements from those people it's amazing uh, what you could not tell anyone else what had happened it's amazing what you can do with settlement agreements for news of the world settled against small care for a confidentiality but when he had no right of action against them anyway because he was an external contractor but there was an, a settlement agreement which supposedly bound him to silence Let's go, let's go back just, to the question, I, well, sorry. I just, just, I mean, to, to complete my question, because it's mm. exactly around that issue, around the hush money and, and, and silencing mm. the claimants, um, and indeed, even if there are prosecutions and they go ahead, then the evidence will be uh, focused on the individual prosecutions. Uh, do you think that we should have a full public inquiry to actually try and get at the, the, the news international files, to your point, uh, uh, David Aronovich, about, about it spreading more broadly. I mean, how, how are we going to get to the position where we actually know stuff when lots of the, the, the civil cases get closed down? <laughs> I think it's all, reveal it. it's all gone through the shredder. Well, uh, I mean, interestingly, ago, yeah. I would have thought. I mean, in, in Sienna Miller, it was a term of the settlement that she got disclosure. How much disclosure she actually got, um, we, we, we don't know. And yes. Uh, Maybe the documentation doesn't exist anymore. We just uh, well, maybe a public inquiry wouldn't be able to do much more than the disclosure process in the civil cases is doing anyway. The, the uh, problem you have, Martin, is that can you think of many public inquiries which are just not synonymous with whitewashes? Uh, yes, yes, I can too. I think I think you need. It's all these uh, cases are being brought under civil law, and claimants have got very limited rights to get documents of. News group, Glenmore Care, or, or whoever. It, it's very tough as a litigant to get documents. But the people who can de get documents are police as part of police investigations where they turn up with a warrant and walk away with the hard disks. But I think it just as a matter of reality, I can't ima I, I can imagine there are a number of private investigators who've uh, taken steps to uh, make sure they. The evidence isn't there anymore. I just want to say about, uh, something about this in, uh, in kind of overall principle. When I worked at the BBC, there was something called the Producers' Guidelines. The Producers' Guidelines were a series not of legal, but essentially of journalistic and ethical notions about what it is you could and couldn't do as a journalist. Um, and where there were grey areas, they would then be taken to the Chief of Editorial Policy and, a and, a and an editorial group, which would discuss what to do. They would concern things like doorstepping, invasions of privacy, and so on. Doorstep was quite, a, uh, was quite an interesting one. But secret filming being an absolute classic. 
Um, secret filming, for instance, was not allowed on a fishing expedition. You weren't allowed to secretly film simply because you thought if you did there was a possibility that something might happen but you didn't know what. And yet a fishing expedition is exactly what the Telegraph did with relation to Vince Cable. It was exact. They had absolutely no notion whether they'd get anything or not. And actually, by and large, they didn't get anything. They by the way, can I just a better deal with uh, that? Because um, the Telegraph was mentioned um, mm -hmm. earlier. And the first thing I'll just say briefly is that uh, Aronovich wasn't answering the question you'd asked him at all. He just changed the subject, talked about the uh, Telegraph um, uh, thing which exposed Vince Cable's remarks about um, actually, uh, 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 actually Peter, uh, I, was making a, I was making a rather bigger you point. You were changing the subject. Well, actually, let's ask, did you think he was changing the subject or not? <laughs> or were you? What? <laughs> Sorry? Or were you? Can you change his point? Yeah, no, the point... <laughs> The point that I was trying, the, the point I was going, the point I was made, which was an answer, was which was, which was an answer to it was, and it wasn't just a simple bash on the Telegraph because lots of other people do it as well. Which is when I when I moved from the BBC to print journalism, um, people talked about the PCC Code of Conduct, but when I went first went to the internet, I couldn't find a single journalist who'd read it. In the period that I've been in written journalism, what I've seen amongst younger journalism is a more or less complete ignorance of what you might describe as the ethics of journalism, as I was taught them in broadcast in a broadcast yeah, yeah. journalism. The point I'm making is the point about um, uh, phone hacking is important to people because it is a legal question. But actually, the notion of ethical practice in journalism, which is a much bigger question, has actually been a really big problem for a very, for a much, much longer time. Uh, now, you can imagine a situation whereby phone hacking, uh, the phone hacking was a, uh, for a while, phone hacking was legal. When they first had mobile phones, etc., uh, uh, there was nothing specific. I think, Tony, uh, David, am I wrong about this? Uh, regulation in the Investigatory Powers Act uh, came in just before the Human Rights Act 1998. Yeah. After then, if you squinted your eyes and pretended it didn't say what it said, you could say it wasn't unlawful and that but it was just like then. opening an envelope. But before then? Before then, under the Interception of Communications Act, it was uh, arguably uh, not, a pr not prohibited. Not prohibited, uh, exactly. So, the, so now. I ask, want to ask you, is there an ethical difference between the moment before it was prohibited and the moment after it was prohibited by a specific law? Now, I would argue that there's not, that actually it was unethical on both sides of that line and shouldn't have been done, and that there are other practices unethical on both side, on, on, on the legal yeah. side of the line, yeah. which still shouldn't be done because they're journalistically yeah. unethical. So, um, Peter, everyone's ready to yeah. come back. Well, I do need to answer. The first, I, as I understand it, your question was, just to we get clear about this, that can we, do we need a public inquiry into phone hacking? That was what your question was. And other illegal methods of intrusion. And other illegal methods of intrusion. He didn't answer the question about an illegal inquiry into phone hacking, whether or not that was because of the... I mean, I, I don't want to speculate what that may be. Instead of which, he changed the subject to, to the te what the Telegraph did, and which, which was reported on by Ofcom. Now, um, I, I regard that, but uh, the audience can... I, I'm going to deal with the question, by the way, but I, the audience can form its own judgment. Eventually, you will. That's right, yeah. change, the, uh, change the subject. <laughs> and uh, it's, it, 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 earlier you said, uh, you, you said that this, this practice of phone hacking was very widespread. That's quite clear. Well, I, maybe it was, but at the moment, the overwhelming evidence is that it took place at the, the company you work for, News International. In the case of the Telegraph... How do you define overwhelming in that statement? Have you... Um, <laughs> there is evidence, but overwhelming... overwhelming evidence. From s well, have you, have you, do you read well, the from, gun from, from the Metropolitan Police, uh, yes, thank you. not four weeks ago, released evidence that I th either three th in the high 3,000 or high 4,000 people's names were on Mulcair's but files. But only at News International. Numbers, no, oh yes, News That's inter the point the I'm making. numbers were there. And the f not the mobile phone number, but the special number you need to get into the voicemail. Now, if you find those numbers in someone's file, there's only yeah. one reason it's but there. It's not any way to get the basic. I read The Guardian. I get most of my stuff on this from The Guardian. It seems that, that about the News International hacked into the accounts of th several thousand people in this country. So, no, 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 so anyway, I, no, 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 Peter, I'm going to have to correct you here. I mean, just because kind of... It, 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 
It is not they true didn't. that no, it's not true that News International did. It isn't true that News it, well, International. They, they no, 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 no. Well, it may very well be that News International, as a, a bigger corporation, has has otherwise as afterwards covered it up. But it has actually the papers involved yeah, well, who are accused which, which of being owned by News International. No, no, no. no you right, get, uh, you, uh, there we are. Right, uh, the, the, that's the, true. The news of the world. As well. well, let uh, me uh, rephrase uh, that. The news of the world, which is owned by News International and whose chief executive is Rebecca Wade, a former editor of now Brooks, the former editor of the News of the World. Am I right about that? Yeah. Uh, and who we read very remarkably little. Imagine did, if did she Paul Dacre know about phone cracking? Um, I when you were there. Ask him. Look, I, actually, uh, you ask Almost him. certainly is the answer, Peter. Look, I, Almost I, certainly. I, my, my, you have to ask him. Uh, I think the answer from him is no, but I haven't, you must ask him. <laughs> I'm sure that's been the answer. But I mean, look, if you, find, if you make that sort of suggestion, you're a lawyer, I believe. I mean, provide the evidence. There's abundant evidence. There is enormous evidence that the news of the world knew of phone hacking. We've just heard they paid hush money to stop people talking about no, that's it. That's true. No that's such true. allegations are made, made against the newspapers. Are made against the news. And I think you should, quite frankly, withdraw that that sort of remark with its suggestion that Paul Dacre did. No, have evidence. Peter, I think you should take him to court. No, no, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> my business at all. I'm not going to take him to I'm court. I'm but then you go and make you make slurs on people. I mean, I I, I, I thought that David. Ronovich's remarks about Paul Dacre were extremely fair. I didn't argue with them. You all make it. You were, I don't know what. I, I have, actually, I have the blissful anyway. situation of being a columnist. I don't have to get involved in the news operation. Is the I have no idea. Okay. I can't say one way or another. But I suggest that you should all withdraw right. a slur on Paul Dacre. Did you have a suggestion? A question. Can, can we? Um, as, as you are a lawyer, a question, as John Juno pointed out, the editor of Sunday, can be libelous. I was just interested in that. Uh, anyway, uh, so I just did go go back to deal with the, new, the Daily Telegraph, which has been uh, in a attempt to divert attention. The Daily Telegraph, um, the Information, uh, Information Commissioner's report into blagging, which is the illegal or the unethical obtaining of information through uh, from bank accounts and tax accounts and so forth. Do you know how many uh, cases of blagging were found against the Daily Telegraph? Nil. Not one. Nil. And I need also to defend the, tele the I think that our expenses story, which I think one of the greatest stories that the Telegraph has ever broken, or any newspaper has ever broken, has an overriding public interest. Whether or not I have no, I can't comment on whether any illegality was involved in obtaining the well, information. Well, it was bought. It was bought for uh, for over a hundred thousand pounds right. from there the same people. From the same people who offered it from the Times. Now, I the think time, we, the I Times th looked at it and turned it down because he didn't think it was a story. I mean, no, 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 no. no that's not. <laughs> Peter, that's it's it. absolutely Peter, really Peter, Peter, that's not. Yeah. Peter, that's, that's, Peter, Peter, that's, lu that's <laughs> ludicrous. We wrongly turned it down, uh, maybe, but we turned it down because we thought it was actually, funnily enough, unethical to take a stolen mm. disc. That's the that is actually but the reason whether you like it or not. Anyway, um, I, I, I insist okay. that there's an overwhelming Pete, public interest. Pete, so, yeah. Good, you've, you've done your defence yeah. of, of the Telegraph. Um, <laughs> I just I, I'm going to go to another question. Let me just um, put this let this hang in the air a bit. Um, is there a possibility that as a result of, of everything that's happened uh, in relation to uh, super injunctions, we're talking, I'm sort of picking up on this, on this ethical thing and actually regulation of the newspaper industry, is it possible, and William perhaps can uh, put into this, that if injunctions aren't working anymore, someone's going to take a case to Europe, someone's going to sue the British government and say the only effective way of protecting my privacy is through an injunction and they don't work anymore. So the government will have to perhaps come in, and it may be that having broken the system, the newspapers might find themselves under tighter regulation, perhaps even a statutory regulator, more like an Ofcom. Is there, is there a possibility that that might happen? I don't know um, whether that relates in any way to your question, but um, I'd like to hear from two newspaper men about, about that. Um, let's, have, let's have the question first, maybe come back to that. Um, well, it's, it's, it's kind of related. Um, m my question is really, uh, to the panel in general, regardless of the outcome of the, um, the public debate on the balance of uh, rights and ethics we value as a society, um, does the panel think that there's actually a way in practice of enforcing that balance in the context of um, viral social media leaks, the international element they present, um, and the increasing reliance people place on them to get their news? I, I can't speak as as a technical expert, I think the technical expertise is crucial here, but I think there must be ways of mitigating it because organisations such as Twitter, Facebook, Google are commercial organisations, but they do have 
Uh, it's overstating it to call a moral agenda, but I don't think they necessarily want to facilitate some of the things that go on. And when you you do deal with them, and I have had some experience of dealing with them, it's, it's a bureaucratic nightmare. But ultimately, for instance, if someone's put up a false Facebook page, um, that's a case I had presenting someone falsely as, as an anti-Semite fascist, then Facebook will take it down, they're a bit slow. Twitter will release information if there's a court order and it's quite clear that someone's rights have been infringed. You have to go so to America to get that, don't you? It, it's so expensive that it's, this is a case where you have to be wealthy to jump through all those legal hoops. The shortcut is to have some sort of governmental solution where you would have more powers and more money to do that, short of introducing legal aid for people in a position like that. David, can I just, I just... Sorry, what did you just say? You said that's not going to happen, is it? Well, it's very difficult because our politicians yeah. do actually seem to, to live in fear of the media and, 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 and don't re really want to grasp these problems. I mean, the EU will grasp it. I mean, President Sarkozy, other EU leaders think, well, let's, there's a problem, let's try and sort it out. Whereas in England, it's kind of... Everyone's just standing off at the moment. Yeah, I think so. We've got about five minutes left, so um, another question, please. I was just wondering how um, much you think it's the case that um, the, it's seen as the rich are making the laws, that the rich are creating these super injunctions and uh, creating their own privacy around them. And, w well, the case with Imogen Thomas and Ryan Giggs was that she couldn't get her super injunction. Well, she couldn't get the information released about her, but Ryan Giggs... Well, she could get the information. He, Ryan Giggs, yeah. wasn't it? But there's an inequality. That's a sort of, an inequality. That's a sort of, and that's been, uh, that's been sort of parlayed, hasn't it? As well, I mean, they, it, it favours rich. The rich, rich men. the rich have greater access to the law shock. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I mean, uh, can, can we just say one thing about this? We are not interested, by and large, in the sex lives of the poor and anonymous. Quite a good point. Uh, for instance, let's say for instance, and one of you might kind of wonder, which of you is the poorest and the most anonymous person here? Yeah. You could come up here and begin to talk about your sex life, and the room would empty. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so on. <laughs> Anybody yes, else? David, if you yeah. were to do the same, I think we'd be um, I think attention. if I was to do the same, the room would also end. <laughs> <laughs> for entirely for completely reason. different and yeah. boring yeah. reasons. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, there's been quite a bit of debate on, on, on that, hasn't there? I'm, I'm, listen, I think we're probably... Have we got time for maybe one more? Yeah, the gentleman down the front. Thank you. Just picking up on the question that you were going to put to uh, Peter and to David, what next for the future of the PCC? Yeah, well, I'm really interested in this. You know, David, you say that there's no, you know, that the spine, the backbone's gone out of sort of e ethics in journalism. I had, how do you put it back okay, in? Okay, I how said it. Back no, 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 look. The I have, ever since I came from the world of broadcasting, I've looked at this thing called the BCC. I regard it as utterly pathetic completely pathetic, more or less totally pointless. There might be some kind of slight kind of edge. People have nearly no useful redress against papers except the redress of public opinion when papers go too far. That's what Peter mentioned with regard to Elton John. The reason why it stopped was not because anybody took it to the PCC but because its readers said, do fuck off. Um, and that ultimately is going to be the test. And if, no, and if readers don't and if audiences don't then actually I can't see the point of it. But do, do we have to rely on that? Can't we? Isn't there a better solution? I mean, to, can't, why don't you know? I, I know what, journalism schools, journal, journalistic codes of ethics. Why don't you? And, uh, you know, well, are you no, saying no, the PCC should be scrapped and there should be? You know, perhaps the pre you know the Sun has its no, own no, no, the has its own the news channel, doesn't it? it no, it's the PC, the PCC. Why not bring should, it off PCC now? should be beefed up, maybe as part of a school of journalism and so on, in which ethics is maybe you know the, the Reuters school of journalism should take it over and have a and run courses on journalistic ethics. Journalistic ethics are important. It's important that journalists are taught ethics. I think that that is vital. But I have to say that the PCC is not an organisation that has ever assisted in the process of doing that, I don't think. Okay. Peter? I, I think that um, David Aronovich is, is basically r right uh, on that point. Uh, I, I think that the uh, the person I think is completely pathetic in all of this, actually, at the moment, is Jeremy Hunt, the Culture Secretary. I, to have stayed absent from this great debate, which is uh, apparently he is Minister for Culture, Media and Sport, something like that, um, is, is pathetic. And, the re and he's scared of the press. I think that's exactly right. And I, I think, in due course, there should be some kind of 
judicial review into the press. I mean, there was one in 1948, wasn't there? A great review into the British press uh, in the aftermath of World War II. Uh, and uh, I don't think necessarily that statutory regulation is the answer. <coughs> I tend to bridle against that. But I do think that with the issues we talk tonight are, are of huge, uh, pregnant with importance. Yeah. Okay, I think at that point we're going to have to draw uh, proceedings to a close. Can I uh, just ask you please so show your appreciation to our panel?